Welcome to Preparation Day, your weekly preparation for the Sunday Mass here at Christ the Redeemer and throughout the rest of the world, for those of us joining us not from Christ the Redeemer. This week, you would have received your weekly update. Um, There's a few things in it that are important for the upcoming seasons at the end of October and in November. Now, again, some of this stuff is a little different than what we've done in the past because we have to be a little creative over what we can do surrounding the coronavirus and taking um, uh, the health and safety of everybody into precaution at the same time. So the first item coming up is the drive boo. So on October 30th, between 5 and 7 p.m., Christ the Redeemer will host a trunk or treats drive boo. Now, that's going to be slightly different than what we've done in the past. And uh, as you can imagine, by slightly different, I mean it's going to be really, really different. Um, You'll notice that October 30th is a Friday. Usually we do that on a Saturday. But uh, that Saturday is Halloween. And uh, this particular kind of thing that we would want to do would would really uh, uh, fight the the other activities going on around Halloween. So between 5 and 7 p.m., we will... uh, Myself and several staff members will be out in the parking lot. Uh, If you remember what we did when Father Prentice left us earlier this year, we're uh, using that format uh, again and trying to create something as close to what we're used to doing uh, with the trunk or treats, uh, but in in a way that's safe for all of us throughout the coronavirus. So uh, there will be trick or treating for all of our kids uh, in a car line. So you just drive up in your car. Um, and, uh, we'll have gifts for every kid, every, uh, child, there'll be music and prizes. We'll give out uh, door prize, uh, tickets. Um, and some of those will be given, some prizes will be given the day of some prizes will be announced here after, uh, the next time we have, uh, this preparation day after, um, after Halloween, uh, we'll also have a, uh, costume contest that will be run through our Facebook and will be voted on through likes. So there's going to be a lot more specific information coming up, but we wanted to let you know that while even though we, it, will be, it would be very difficult to do our usual trunk or treats, we're going to do something uh, diff- very different this year. Um, and my hope is that, um, God willing, the coronavirus is gone by the end of October next year. Um, we'll go back to our huge outdoor activity and be ready for that. The Blessing of the Graves coming up this year is going to be on Saturday, uh, October 31st at St. John, and then all of the other graveyards in Thibodeau at various times on Sunday, November 1st. I'll be going and participating with St. Joseph Co-Cathedral, as all of the other ones are. um, We have Mass at those times, and I I can't be able to go. But uh, I'll be at the St. Joseph uh, Co-Cathedral Blessing of the Graves, if you're interested in going to that. All Souls Day Mass this year is ordinarily when we would celebrate the large memorial mass. And we I'm just concerned about the number of people that you, that would usually come to that would, would, would more than max out our church. Um, we haven't had as many deaths in our parish this year as we usually experience, and that's a wonderful thing. That also is slightly more convenient for our uh, coronavirus situations. So what we're going to do is we're going to celebrate the Memorial Mass three times. This is one of the few days along with Christmas Day that the church allows a priest with, with, with no questions asked to celebrate Mass three times. And so we'll celebrate Mass for uh, All Souls Day at 7.30 a.m. at the usual time. And that would be our usual parish Mass for Memorial for, uh all Souls Day. I wanted to say Memorial Day there. That's not right. Okay. Then we'll have a 12.05, essentially a noon mass, and a 5.30 p.m. mass that will take the place of our big memorial mass. So invitations have been sent out to everyone um, connected with somebody from our parish who has died this year, um, inviting them to come and participate in our memorial mass uh, tradition here. Again, my hope is next year we'll go back to the big memorial mass that's very help, helpful and it's a deep spiritual practice for all of our all of our people. We just got to be concerned about overloading our church um, coming All Souls Day. Many people have been asking me about the Day of the Dead altar. We will be doing that again. The only thing that's going to change is uh, we, we may have to be a little careful with the pickup when this is over, but that's in the middle of November. We don't need to worry about that at the moment. So the Day of the Dead altar will begin on October 30th 
which is a Friday, and will run through November 19th. So I invite you to bring a famed, framed pictures of your deceased loved ones and place them on our altar located in the church lobby. And be sure to mark your pictures with your name and contact information so that we can get all that stuff back to you. Okay. Next week, we're going to have Mercy Night on Wednesday. Uh, that starts at 6 and runs till 7.30 and is an opportunity to come and pray and, and spend time with the Lord. Um, I do not have all of the information right at my fingertips, but there are a handful of hours in the Adoration Chapel that are still sort of open. Um, one of them that really has nobody to cover it, and we've, we've been going as we dealing with it as we go along. Uh, and then there's a few of them that have somebody temporarily covering, covering them. So if you have the ability and the desire to spend an hour with the Lord, uh, please feel free to call the office and we'll get you connected with uh, Miss Sarah, who organizes our chapel. Okay. In this Sunday's readings, you will hear this letter from St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of, Thess- of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give you, we give thanks to God always for all of you, remembering you in our prayers, unceasingly calling to mind your work of faith and labor of love, and endurance in hope of our Lord Jesus Christ before our God and Father, knowing brothers and sisters loved by God, how you were chosen. For our gospel did not come to you in word alone, but also in the power of the Holy Spirit and with much conviction. The word of the Lord. Now, what sticks out to me, or at least was pointed out to me as I was reading this passage and researching it a little bit, is that this is not a letter addressed from St. Paul alone. Instead, it's by St. Paul and two of his closer collaborators, Silvanus, who also in another place is called Silas, and Timothy. And and the whole thing about this is St. Paul is not saying, this is from me. He's saying, this is from the presbyters, this is from the overseers, the bishops, and, and, and we come to you together. Now, here's what I, here's what I want to point out. It's, it's not Paul's style, nor is it Jesus' style. It's not his teaching method or his missionary method to go out by himself and just, you know, to Jesus, just be a Messiah, be present to people. But Jesus, when he went into ministry, he had the 12 surrounding him. And even when he sent them away, he sent them away two by two, providing the backbone and the blueprint for what evangelists should do as they go out and uh, seek to do missionary activity. Now, Paul does the same. His, his crew is a little smaller. It's usually just him and one other person. But he always goes out as part of a team tagged with somebody else. Now, what's also important is that those teams were not always like neat and tidy. We we have this idea of like Paul went on this great evangelist evangelistic journey and just like the, the doors open for him from beginning to end. And it was all easy. No, it was not famously. So there's the famous fight between St. Peter and St. Paul, where Paul corrects Peter in front of, in front of the other workers. But there's also the falling out between uh, St. Mark the gospel writer and St. Paul um, over Mark's having abandoned them um, out of fear. So things got dangerous. So Mark ran away, which of course it, it, the, the poor dude was just afraid um, and reacted in, in the fight or flight mechanism, just like ran away, which I, I'm sure uh, I, I can't speak for everybody, but I don't know if I have that kind of courage that if I was under actual pain of death, and it was easy for me to run away and put in Mark's shoes. I don't know if I would have done any different. And it's hard to say if any of us would have done any different unless we get put in that situation. But it's not clean and tidy. We all, we all know that one of Jesus' disciples, Judas, betrayed him. We know that St. Peter uh, didn't really help, that it was kind of messy. James and John wanted to call down fire on a city that it cast them out. It, it, it wasn't ni- ni- nice and neat and tidy. But they were together in the end. So I want to draw your attention. There's a, there's a saying, I believe it's from uh, G.K. Chesterton. He says, um, those who like sausages should not research how, look in too much into how they're made. 
And so yeah, the, 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 the mode of speech is meant to say that uh, if when you dig into the, the making of something, often you find that it's messy and difficult. I think we have this vision of like church councils as being like this easy, clean thing where the Holy Spirit just sits in his throne and tells us what to do and not to do. And the historical record just doesn't show that. It's messy, just like any other large group of people working together to pursue either compromise or the truth. There's some kind of there's messiness involved. And we get this image when we get this view when the church, uh, when when Paul sends the delegation to Jerusalem asking the question about circumcision, that there was some lively debate back and forth. Almost all of the church councils, if if you go back and read the actual historical record, there's a lot of lively debate back and forth. The uh, council fathers trying to find the truth so that they could proclaim it or declare it. Uh, the, and the Second Vatican Council was no different. You know, it, as long as there are human beings involved, there's going to be some amount of conflict. And of course, you're all familiar with um, the various videos and and even American history, um, to be honest. But but every once in a while, there's a video that'll pop up of like a foreign senate and uh, they'll they'll actually break out into a fist fight. Well, that happened at a lot of church councils, too. That that's not just um, secular governments today. No, 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 no. Um, And those early church councils, they got really fired up about this stuff. And and sometimes it would break out into in, into fist fights. So it's it's not always going to be nice and neat and tidy and clean and easy. But instead, this working out of a team, this community that St. Paul was uh, forged in and did his ministry in, uh, they had a lot of difficult conversations. They had a bunch of challenges. And uh, we shouldn't expect our lives to be any different. But St. Paul's ministry, because he endured through it, it bore fruit. Because of the challenges, it got a chance to grow and thrive. And if we look at even at the, at the at the apostles, a lot of the messiness of the twelve bore out in the life of Simon, who through that messiness becomes more and more and more Peter. Not perfect, but even the great difficulty that came out of their ministry, the ministry that they did, the message that they brought out and how that was, sometimes it was hard, sometimes it was easy, that that bore fruit in Peter's life so much so that he was ready to go to his own death like Jesus and be prepared for it. Uh, and, and in fact, gave him new life. St. Paul uh, used the great difficulties that he experienced in his evangelical ministry, not only to give himself uh, not only to, to spread the, the, the message, but it, it made him the, the man that he was. It made him the Christian that he was. Now, all of that's important because Christianity comes out of community. At the smallest level, it comes out of the community of the family, um, which St. John Paul II called the domestic church, so the home church. So that in every home, there is a little church that is the, that, that, that is without exception, the fundamental building block of the larger church community. It, it's, it's not a thousand individuals. It's a bunch of families who come together, brick, 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 brick. And out of that, the church is made. So it, it, it's actually kind of nice that our church is made out of bricks. And if you would look at the bricks of the church when you're in it next time, think of each of those as one of our individual family units. If it's not strong, it becomes... A, a weak link in the wall. But when it is strong, it provides a great strength to the wall. But it's also a bunch of bricks. So if we look in the community of the family, there's a community there, and there's going to be some need for some difficult conversations, and there's going to be some wonderful days, and there's going to be some challenging days, and there's going to be days when one person of the family has to leave. To Maybe, you know, maybe they're having a bad day and, and but but primarily, you know, especially children, at some point you, you, you move on, you move to the next step and maybe you become the next brick with your family or you move on to a different calling in life or, or you just have to you move away. You follow wherever the work is or, or, or whatever, however it goes. But the, the larger church is also made up of these communities. And so one of the things that seems to work the best and one of the places that I have uh, seen a lot of fruit 
in ministry is when we minister out of the context of a team. You know, that's what Jesus did. That's what St. Paul did. That's what um, all the popes have done. That it's not just me on my own and you on your own. And and we're all a whole bunch of desperate, separated individual cells of of, of cells of individuals. But instead, we operate as a team so that uh, me who has my set of gifts and, 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 and just like all of us, painfully aware of the gifts that I lack or the gifts I wish I had and maybe not so easily aware of the gifts that I do have. But my gifts will supplement other people's gift. And people who have gifts that I don't have will help supplement my gift. And we grow as a larger family together. No one person has all the gifts. St. Paul makes that clear. And it would, and it's, and even he makes it clear that it's foolish for one person to even pretend like they have all of the gifts, or to try and be, try and have a gift they don't have. But instead, like it seems that God has broken up the charisms, the gifts, to force us to work together, so that if we, if, if I try and do this on my own, I might in my work. It might be okay, and and the things I try and do may bear fruit. Certainly, there have been hermits throughout the history of the Catholic Church, but the large, real fruitful ministries come out of this team context where the Lord is working through the gifts given through multiple different people. And St. Paul did that. We can clearly see his writing is... uh, was shared by two other authors. Um, and that's not to mention the other people that might have been there, the scribes, the copyists, uh, the, the, you know, the people, St. Paul telling them what to write and then they're writing it down, or some people taking what has been written and then copying it so that the letter could be distributed amongst the different churches in the city. And St. Paul operated on that team context and bore a, a ministry so fruitful that we're still talking about the things that he wrote uh, all these many years later. Of course, the writings of St. Paul were inspired and that, you know, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit probably helps a whole lot in the uh, permanence of the things that you do when you do ministry. But that doesn't mean that we can't do awesome things that will last a lifetime here in our own parish. And if we consider that a possibility, man, then we would have access to what the Holy Spirit really wants us to do in here in our parish. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and loving God, we give you thanks for this day, particularly the way you've given us the ability to to, uh, exercise our faith in freedom. We ask you, Lord, that you would continue to guide our church as you always have. Extend your hand over our nation, protect our president, help him to heal quickly. Um, Help our election to be fair and just, as well as uh, bring great unity into our nation. We ask you, Lord, that you would continue to protect us from oncoming destructive storms this hurricane season and throughout all of time and history. Lord, we ask you to bless our family here at Christ the Redeemer, particularly the people that they have asked us to pray for and all of our special intentions. We ask you, Lord, that you would help bring a swift end to the coronavirus, keep all of us safe. We ask you to uh, continue to pour out on us vocations to the priesthood, to the consecrated life for more holy marriages. We ask you, Lord, for a special grace for the Archdiocese of New Orleans that would help them continue to heal and grow. And then finally, Lord, we lift up all of these prayers into your hands, trusting that in your providence you know the way to best give them to us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.